And welcome into the locker room here on TV24. I'm Chase Robinson alongside Gerhard Mathangani. Got a great show lined up for you today. We got some great topics to discuss. Uh, we'll talk to the SEC radio host, Brad Law, as well. But first, Gerhard and I are going to preview some games. So let's start uh, with a big one with the Alabama Crimson Tide. You know, the Alabama fans. Remember last year that right. game ended with the Ole Miss fans tearing down the goalposts. Right. So talk about this game and uh, kind of what it means to Alabama to, uh, you know, people don't beat Nick Saban more than twice. Exactly. So talk about what, what he, uh, is going on with Ole Miss. He is the king. He is the king of adjustments as far as making sure that his team doesn't get beat, like you said, two times in a row. Interesting storyline for this game is that Chad Kelly, the quarterback for Ole Miss, right now putting up video game-like numbers. 76 points, I think, in the first week, 73 points in the second week. Averaging over 70. I mean, this, these are basketball numbers that this, that this Ole Miss team is putting up. But I just think that Nick Saban will adjust a lot more and a lot faster. And not to mention, just like you see in these highlights, they played a fastball team last week in Middle Tennessee State. Uh, you know, a lot of people are, are not real happy with Jake Coker right now. They right. expect more of an Alabama quarterback. What are your thoughts as you've seen Jake Coker these last couple of weeks? He, it's surprising how slow I think that he's developed. I just think that not that I mean, fans are fanatics, but in, in a small way, they kind of have a point. Like they, they, you would expect the quarterback at this point to have at least a little bit more footing on the starting job. And the fact that, you know, Coach Saban is still giving Coker Bateman, or Cooper Bateman, I'm sorry, lots of reps, it kind of shows that they're not all sold in on Jake Coker just yet. So I kind of understand the fans' a little bit of apprehension, but this is a great test right here against a very good team. And Nick Saban spoke with the media this week, and here's what he had to say about preparation for this game. The key thing that the players and everybody needs to understand is, um, you know, playing a team like we're playing this week, it's going to be necessary for us to, you know, play better in this game, execute better, be more consistent, um, have better fundamental execution. And I think the best way to do that is to focus on preparation uh, each day this week. You know, what do you do on Monday? What do you do on Tuesday? What do you do on Wednesday? What do you do on Thursday? Uh, and really get it down and carry it into the game with good focus. You can catch that game. It's the late game Saturday night, 8:15 on ESPN. Let's move to Auburn now. Last week had an unexpected test mm -hmm. against JSU. Right. This week, LSU. What's going on with the Auburn Tigers? It, it, when you're an Auburn fan, you have to wonder if this team is what we stack this team up to be at the beginning of the year. By we, I mean the media. I think that Auburn won't have that kind of performance again. And I think that everything kind of stacked up the right way against Jacksonville State. But Jacksonville State beat them up and down the line of scrimmage. Let's not take that away from, from Jacksonville State. And we will see a strong JSU team later on. But I think that at some point, Auburn has to click into the team that they actually really are. This is the first chance to do that. This is a very, very tough game. Obviously one of the hardest places to play in the SEC down in the bayou down there in LSU. But here's the thing. It's either sink or swim time for Auburn, and right now it's that first test. Let's talk about their quarterback situation. A lot of people had high expectations for Jeremy Johnson. Right. Not quite done that so far this right. season. Uh, what are your thoughts on Jeremy Johnson? Y you hit on Jake Coker, and I think that there's an interesting contrast between these two because there's interesting levels of disappointment because Coker was decided, he was the guy that was supposed to just take this program over. Jeremy Johnson was the guy that was supposed to maybe win a Heisman Trophy. And so the levels of expectation as opposed to what we've gotten over the first eight quarters of the season, I just think are a little bit different from for fans. But just like I said, I think that the team will settle in and play a little bit more like we expect them to on Saturday, I think Jeremy Johnson will do the same. And Malzahn spoke with the media as well, and here's what he had to say. From a player standpoint, I mean, you know when you don't play your best, but uh, the bottom line is we're 2-0, and and we start our conference play. Our guys know we didn't play our best, but they know we can play a whole lot better, and our coaches do too, and we will. We expect to. So, uh, you know, that's that's behind us, and we're looking forward to going to LSU, and that's the way you look at it when you're, when you're in the moment and you're a coach or a player. Um, you know, that's behind you, and, and you look forward, and you, you, you do everything you can to improve. Auburn's got the 2.30 CBS game Saturday afternoon, and let's move to Auburn's opponent from last week, JSU. Right. We were talking after the, the JSU-Auburn game Saturday night. Uh, you know, I was down there on the field mm -hmm. uh, with JSU and Auburn, and before the game during warm-ups, right. I noticed a really special intensity from JSU yeah. that I've never seen before. 
and as we saw, it really played out well for them not to keep harping on last week. Right. Uh, but talk about JSU, and, and they start conference play this week, and that game has to play a big role in conference play. Yeah, as much as the players do the lip service of all the things that you, that you want, and that lip service is, hey, we have to focus on this week. We can't take last week. we got to take the emotion out of it. I understand all the coach speak, and I understand what you have to say. But you have to know that this week in practice, that's exactly what's been on their mind, is last week. And if they can use that for fuel, perfect. I mean, lots of great athletes, lots of great teams have done that. They use emotional losses as fuel because they honestly think down deep in their hearts, probably as they should, they should have won that game. And they are as good as Auburn right now. Of course, the season will play itself out and we will see. But I do think that JSU in the first half of the Tennessee State game will be very important. We'll see how much that Auburn game actually played in in that first half of Tennessee State this week. All right, and here's what John Gross had to say about opening up conference play this week against Tennessee State. You know, you get to the game three as a counter. You know, it's it's OVC conference game, so it does it is tied definitely to to our goals. You know, we have to win these games to to give ourselves a chance to win that championship, getting in the playoffs. So there's a there's an importance there. But uh, you know, like I said, we played two great opponents to start start the year off with Chattanooga and, and with Auburn, and uh, those are like playoff games and you know national championship games. So uh, we like well, those two games help prepare us for our OVC run. You know, which is a tough run but I'll say this we got to come every week to play and uh, it'll be how we practice because you know, I go back to that deal you're gonna play like you practice you know and uh, we got to practice well and you know fix the things that we did wrong you know on Saturday and, and get better at them. And JSU opens up conference play this Saturday at 105 you can catch that game right here on TV 24 and also on ESPN3. Well, coming up here in the locker room, we'll go one on one with SEC Sports Radio host Brad Law. So stay with us. We got more here on the locker room. And welcome back into this week's edition of the locker room. This segment, we're going to take a little break from the chat and uh, join a one-on-one -on -one interview. And this one goes back to July from SEC Media Days. I caught up one-on-one -on -one with Brad Law from SEC Sports Radio, and here's our one-on-one -on -one interview. Here at SEC Media Days with SEC Sports Radio and IMG host uh, Brad Law. Uh, Brad, you're from East Alabama, have ties there. Talk about how you got started in this business. Well, I, uh, I started doing Piedmont High School basketball games when I was a sophomore in high school. I would play in B-team games and then uh, go put on a shirt over my basketball uniform and broadcast the girls game and the A-team varsity game uh, just in basketball shorts and tennis shoes. I knew that I couldn't play beyond high school but wanted to be involved in sports somehow and so started in sports broadcasting in that way and thankfully over the years we've, we've had some opportunities to do pretty exciting things like be here at SEC Media Days. And how did that opportunity come about for you to get involved with the SEC Radio and IMG Sports? A little less than uh, 10 years ago, I moved to Auburn to go to school there and to work with their radio network and ISP Sports, who owned the rights to the Auburn broadcasts at the time. And at the time, they owned the rights to Troy and UAB and about 20 other schools. And so there was an opportunity there to work with those broadcasts and get a feel for how things were done in multiple locations. That became a full-time job opportunity uh, four years ago. And part of that full-time opportunity with IMG which merged with ISP Sports was working with the SEC radio network. So we've been here for the last four to five years uh, at Media Days every year. It's been a lot of fun. When you go back to, to being a sophomore doing those Piedmont basketball games, what have you learned then uh, that you use now? I think I've learned what it means to be professional in settings. You know, you're, you're talking to LSU's head coach, Les Miles, you're talking to Nick Saban, you're talking to Gus Malzahn, and those guys have pretty heavy time constraints. They know what they want to talk about. They want you to get right to the point, and they will get right to the point. And so I've learned about professionalism. I've learned about developing relationships with people and, and what it means to help others in the, in the business that we're in. 
What's it like going from calling the Calhoun County Basketball Tournament to the SEC Basketball Tournament? I love the Calhoun County Basketball Tournament. I follow the Calhoun County Basketball Tournament every year, and there's a part, a big part of me that wishes every year that I could be at Pete Matthews Coliseum calling the Calhoun County Basketball Tournament every year. But yeah, going from that venue to Nashville and Bridgestone Arena this past year and getting a chance to call Auburn and Texas A&M in a, in a second round game. It's pretty special. Um, what I love about it is you have passionate fan bases. Like when, a when Anniston and Alexandria, which was the championship of the last one that I did 10 years ago, their student sections are packed. Pete Matthews Coliseum is jam packed to the rafters and it's a crazy environment. What's a crazy environment at Bridgestone Arena when Kentucky is battling Florida for the SEC Basketball Championship? And that's the kind of stuff that stays the same, and that, that's what you love about this business is the energy and the excitement that's all around you. What are some memories you've had going back over your whole uh, broadcast career? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I can remember being at Media Days here when Steve Spurrier admitted that he left Tim Tebow off of his All-SEC ballot, that he was the guy in the firestorm that that created. Um, I can remember being at the SEC, you know, all of the SEC championship games uh, that I've been able to be a part of over the last few years working with the SEC radio network to see champions uh, realize their dreams. I've been on the field when the ticker tape was falling around the Alabama players last year. I interviewed Derrick Henry on the field when Alabama was celebrating the SEC championship. And that's, you know, to see guys who work very hard, who put in so much effort and work and who sacrifice so much, to see them celebrating, that's, that's the memorable stuff for me. You've seen sports in East Alabama. Talk about uh, sports there compared uh, to other places in SEC territory. Well, there's there's nothing like the competition within Calhoun County, within surrounding counties. I mean, we've seen a number of Division One athletes come out of uh, come out of Northeast Alabama, and we're watching them now. We've seen them for the past 10, 15 years. Guys at my age have grown up watching and, and following, but the passion that's there and the support, you know parents, family members that will drive for four hours to watch a playoff game or that will drive two hours just to watch a B-team varsity game. It's there. And again, that's what we love so much about sports in East Alabama is you know, the sense of family, the sense of community that we, that we tie to it. Working with the SEC Sports Radio, you get to spend time with these coaches interviewing them. What is that like? Well, it's pretty awe-inspiring. Um, it, it certainly was when I got started. I mean, here are these guys that I watch um, on the sidelines, that I watch coaching their teams. And, you know, one day I, I, I used to want to play for those guys that I watched on TV and, and certainly respect what they do. And now to get to interview them, it's, it's pretty humbling. And it's also challenging to make sure, like at SEC Media Days, where we do 59 interviews over the course of four days, you have to know your stuff. You have to be prepared because it's the it's these guys' lives, and so you better know what you're talking about when when you interview them. To someone who wants to get in this business, what would you tell them? I would say go for it and be willing to do the things that you wouldn't expect to be asked to do early on. I would say be proactive. I would say be aggressive. Um, go ask local radio stations and local TV stations, what do you need? I started in Auburn by answering phones and delivering magazines. That's how I started. And with that little responsibility, it grew to a little more and a little more and a little more. It's very rewarding. It's an awful lot of fun most of the time. Um, and it's worth going and aggressively chasing. Thank you very much uh, for taking time with us today. And thanks again to Brad Law uh, for taking time with us at SEC Media Days for that great one-on-one uh, -on -one interview. Stay with us here on The Locker Room. we got more coming up. It's The Locker Room Roundtable. You don't want to miss it. It's coming up next. And welcome back into the locker room. It's time for our locker room roundtable. Gerhard Mathingani back with us and uh, Mickey Shadricks as well. we got some great topics to discuss. And the first one, guys, JSU taking on Auburn last Saturday. Great game. Does that game put more of a target on JSU's back uh, as they enter in conference play and really for the rest of the season, Gerhard? I think it's no question that it does. I mean, everybody now wants to be the team that hung with the team that might make the Final Four, depending on how Auburn season goes. I just think that 
if JSU just plays the way they're capable of playing, no matter how big the target is on their back, they can win this division, and they, or they can win this conference, and then they can go on to the playoffs as well. No doubt it does. You know, when, when nobody expects anything of you, there's no pressure, and you can just go out and play and not worry about the results. Now, a lot of will be expected of JSU when they play, especially stepping into, you know, back end of the FCS level against the conference opponents. Uh, you know, it, this, there's no doubt they have a target on their back now. Right. A former Jacksonville State coach, Bill Clark, uh, now at UAB, signed a five-year extension. As we know, the football program didn't take place this year. Um, does this restore a lot of confidence in the program? I know a lot of people have been saying things about the UA Board of Trustees and the people behind UAB. Does this restore a lot of confidence, Mickey? I, I guess so. Uh, you know, to me, it. I can't get past what's happened to mm -hmm. even answer that really because I look at it and go, why did we even have to go through this? Right. You know, so I'm kind of hung up on that part of it. It really never had to go this down this road. It did, so I guess yes, theoretically, they're showing they're making a big commitment to one of the hottest young coaching names in the country. Absolutely. I, to borrow a, a, a line that was used in politics in the last election cycle, this is lipstick on a pig. I just think that from an outside perspective, it makes it look like, yes, we're invested, yeah, we're, we're all in. But he did sign a three-year contract before before they shut down the program. So <laughs> it does, it does in, a, in a small sense, make it seem uh, ready for Bill Clark to walk into recruits' homes and say, hey, this program's here and I'm here, and he can feel confident doing that because of what's on the surface. What's underneath it, nobody knows, and I don't think anybody knew before, and definitely nobody knows going forward. I will say this, I think UAB football's here to stay now. Yeah, I do too. I, I think it's here to stay. Right, right. And they had such a great season last season, so I'm excited to see uh, recruiting-wise what can happen uh, when they do bring the football program back. Right, right, and not to mention they're putting their money where their mouth is because now he's making reportedly about a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars more on this contract than he did on the last contract. Uh, well news came out Wednesday morning that an Alabama senator from Daphne, Tripp Pittman, uh, put in a proposal to say that no Alabama University can play a football game before noon. <laughs> Does this have I mean Is he an Alabama and Auburn? Yeah, I was I'm gonna say curious. I don't know which one. He did know? say in quotes Auburn does not play well before noon. Okay, maybe he's an Does Auburn. scheduling, yeah. um, you know, before noon, does that play a factor in the game? I think that, think about practice. Practice comes after about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You think about high school, you play at night. In the NFL, if, you, if you're lucky enough to go there, you play, depending on the time zone you're in, you play later in the afternoon. It is a weird time to play. 11 o'clock kickoffs are weird times to play. But here's the thing, Trip. <laughs> These things are, 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 are so determined by television. Television dollars, television revenue. These 11 o'clock kickoffs are going nowhere as long as TV money's involved. Yeah, I agree. I, evidently, this guy just needed to get something off his chest <laughs> yeah. because there's no way that this will gain any political ground at all. Right. Uh, we have video for this. Let's roll the video uh, from the Auburn JSU game last week. Uh, Blake Countess, uh, as we see here, this play on Eli Jenkins, going in to make the tackle, was called for targeting and ejected for the game. Mickey, do you think the NCAA is time for them to reevaluate the targeting rule? Well, I mean, you see the play there. That was probably one of the softest tackles all day. So let, let's just go ahead and say that I think most people I've talked to think it was a bad call. I personally think it was a bad call. I couldn't recite the targeting rule to you, I'll be honest, but I will tell you, it just didn't look, it didn't look like it justified throwing a guy out of the game. Exactly. That, that's all I right. know. So I guess in that regard, yeah, something needs to be looked at. Maybe when they review it, they can come back and say that wasn't targeting. I, I don't know, but I will say this. Nothing that's been put in place so far to protect the players is going back. Right. We're going forward. Right. They're not going to undo yeah. anything because it threatens the game. Yeah. So I guess if we have to live with things like this to protect the players, maybe that's something we all just have to it is kind of, It does seem kind of a lose-lose, and I think that's the word I use a lot when we were going back and forth talking about that play with some of my friends. It's it just seems like the defensive player really doesn't have much of a position because he everything he does has dictated on what the quarterback does. And so if the quarterback, you know, slides two inches higher or two inches lower, he might still be playing in the game. And it just feels unfair. But like Mickey said, I just don't think that this rule is going anywhere. I just don't think that they're in a position now with everything we know about CTE and everything we know about concussions for this to go backwards. So we might have to live with plays like this and defensive players might just have to stop even making contact on those plays to keep themselves in the game. Put a flag on the quarterback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really. 
I mean, that is a that may we may see that one day a flag only on the quarterback. He mm -hmm. can't go to the ground. You go to him and you pull his flag. Yep. His well, let's take a look at some of the games coming up this weekend in our pick six segment. The first game up, Ole Miss at Alabama. Mickey, who you got in this one? Oh, gosh, I tell you, Ole Miss is rolling, but they haven't played anybody, yeah. so I'm going Bama. Basketball scores, you can score that all you want to. <laughs> this is a different defense, Alabama. I'm going Alabama as well. You can't beat Nick Saban like that twice. Yeah. Next game up, LS, Auburn LSU. Gerhard, who you got in this one? Leonard Fournette is an absolute beast, but I do think Will Muschamp will circle the wagons there. They will, they will get their defensive battles and defensive woes straightened out. I think Jeremy Johnson will be fine. I got Auburn. I'm going I'm, I'm to go Auburn, too. I just, I just can't believe that Auburn is as bad as they played in the first two games. Right. So I don't think LSU is a juggernaut either, so I'll go with Auburn also. I'm going to go different for me. I'm going <laughs> LSU in this one. <laughs> Next game up, we got Florida, Kentucky. Mickey, who you got? Kentucky. I like Florida. I really like what Kentucky's doing, but I, I, there's something there that I think that, uh, that Jim McElwain has got going on over there. I, I don't think they win the East, but I do think it's an intriguing game. I got the Gators. I just want to pick Kentucky over Florida one, day, one year in my life, and this is the year to do it. <laughs> yeah, and it's not basketball where it's intriguing. <laughs> it's actually football. Two new coaches coming up in that one. I got Kentucky in that one as well. Next game up, we got... Jacksonville State and Tennessee State. Mickey, who you got? No doubt JSU. They need to come out and a lot of their frustration from last week, they need to put it on the field against Tennessee State and leave no doubt about this one. Conference opener for JSU. This is the same Tennessee State team that embarrassed them in homecoming. They, players mentioned that on Monday's press conference. I just do think JSU does enough to get over the hump and get that first OVC win. I've got JSU in that one too. Big numbers for JSU, I believe. Next game up, BYU, UCLA, Gerhard. The magic ends for BYU. I mean, these Hail Marys and all this nonsense they've been doing over the last couple of weeks. The Magic ends. I do like UCLA. I really, really, really like their quarterback. And it's a big game for UCLA moving forward in the Pac-12. I'm with UCLA also. Going UCLA as well for that one. Next game, we're moving a little closer to home with the high school matchup. It's our Pigskin Roundup game of the week. Gerhard, who you got in this one? Piedmont Glencoe is so, is so tough. This is going to be one of the toughest football games all year long. I do like Piedmont, though. They're in the, they're in the field of champions. They're at home. They revenge from last year after Glencoe's amazing run. I like the Bulldogs. You know, after what Westbrook did to Glencoe last week, it's kind of made me, you know, wonder how strong defensively they may be. With Piedmont being at home, I'm with Gerhard here. That's why I'm going to go Piedmont if they're at home, if it, because they're at home. If it were at Glencoe, I'd be tempted to go Glencoe. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to see Piedmont, but I've seen Glencoe. They're very impressive, but still, from what I've heard and seen on video, Piedmont uh, looks like the stronger team in this one as well. And you can see the score of that game and all the other local high school games coming up Friday night on the Pigskin Roundup, the Week 5 edition, Friday night at 1030. We'll have highlights from Alexandria, Etowah, Gaston, Weaver, Aniston, and more. As you see there, Game of the Week, Glencoe at Piedmont. Jonathan Miller from Sachs and Montford's new head coach, Bill Smith, will be the guest on the show. And be sure to connect with us on social media by hashtagging Pigskin Roundup. It's been a lot of fun tonight. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here on the locker room. For Mickey Shadrick, Scarehard Mathingani, I'm Chase Robinson. We'll see you next week in the locker room.